Now we are going to begin the second part of our evening with a presentation from the Formations Group. And it's called Propositions, Stories, and Sketches for Transdisciplinary Encounters. And in a way, it ties together some of the individual tracks of anthropotechniques we've seen before into different formations of encounter and collaboration. The members of the group who are present tonight are Melanie Segal, Alex Martinez Rowe, Roman Brinzanik, Deborah Haxman, Julian Schubert, and Hendrik Weber. They come from a variety of training backgrounds, from art and architecture to philosophy, yoga, and biology. Over the past year, they've been meeting and working together to come up with new formats, anthropotechniques, or what they're calling speculative wisdom techniques, to allow these very different disciplines and ways of working to converge, confront each other, and collaborate. And the evening will close, or rather open up again in a new form, with one such technique, a conversation on stage with everyone here in this room who would like to participate. But first, now, Melanie and Alex, welcome. Well, thanks, John, and thanks for you all for sticking around the Saturday night. Um, so tonight and what follows, we would like to share six speculative wisdom techniques um, that came out of our work together as a group, as formations. And so we'll just like share a bit of this work that we did together and be bold and start by presenting formations itself. So the structure and the setup for our working group as our first speculative wisdom technique. And we'll also say a bit about what we mean by this weird and bold term in a while. So what is formations? Formations is, as John already pointed out, a transversal and multidisciplinary working group. So we're practitioners from varying disciplines, including the arts, philosophy, human geography, comp computational biology, yoga, urban design, political activism, cultural and literary studies. And most of us have backgrounds in two of those disciplines, and you'll have the chance to, to meet some of us in doing what follows. So we've been meeting throughout the last year for day-long workshops. And each workshop specifically, specifically centered around the practices of two of our members. Um, and then we engage the others from this vantage point. So we'll say more about the details of this setup um, and techniques in a bit, because as you heard, these are our so-called wisdom techniques. But first, we would like to say a few words of why we created or started this project and what the necessity was for, for us to do so. So formation started out from the same concerns that animate the campus, I think, and, and the work of the HKV in the past year in general, and that have gathered us here tonight, so I don't feel like I need to say too much to it um, about that, but just point to um, some of these concerns, which are mainly concerns about the ways in which knowledge is produced today and somehow no longer seems to be adequate to our contemporary situation. Um, their challenges, challenges that here we've come to call the Anthropocene or technosphere, that to us seem to call extreme specialization and disciplinarization into question. So of course specialization has generated a wealth of, of knowledge and um, that we don't want to, of course, like discredit or lose, but at the same time it seems to foreclose to look at the wider consequences of one's knowledge production. One could say that specialization creates something like mines in a grove, which are blind to the ethical and political consequences of one's own knowledge production. So another problem with our inherited and specialized modes of knowledge production is that they perpetuate implicit assumptions without ever questioning them. Assumptions, for example, that categorically separate nature and culture, body and mind, sex and gender. And of course, like such dichotomies have been subject to extensive critique um, in the past decades. But the starting point for formations was the feeling that they persist nevertheless practically, so particularly in institutionalized spaces. And of course, there are exceptions, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here, so maybe this is a good moment to thank the Haus der Kultur der Welt and particularly Bernd Scherer for providing us the space for experimentation that we had in the past year. Um, yeah, so these dichotomies persist simply by means of the material discursive setup 
of institutionalized spaces by means of the anthropotechniques that one is trained in when one is studying a certain discipline. And by discipline here, I mean like discipline in a large sense, scientific disciplines as well as artistic and bodily practices. So here, theoretical assumptions, which are historically specific, so came out of specific circumstances, are entrenched in our practices by the way we use language, by the way we interact with colleagues, students, financial bodies, publishing industries, you name it. And I think each of us members of formations have experienced the resulting sense of inadequacy of, in our working context. And I think it's like each in our own way, in our specific working environments and disciplines. And this was somehow also one important criteria for us to choose the members when Alex and I were scouting for them. So I'll give my personal example of the sense of inadequacy in, in my context, the university. So in my, context, in my work, I use um, a specific reading of the modern constellation that I take from the philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead, and which was also very important for me for the setup for formations. You could say it's one of many ways of accounting for the modern divides, which you're all aware of, so nature, culture, body, mind, subject, object. But I think that Whitehead's diagnosis for me in some ways is singular because it not only describes these divides, but somehow shows how they work, so how they have come to be historically and systematically. Whitehead points to an inconsistency in the modern concept of nature. So there's on the one hand nature as it is perceived by subjects, and on the other hand there's nature as it is per se, as an object of knowledge, but as such as this object of knowledge, it's never perceived directly, but needs mediation, for example, in a scientific experiment. So by what it speaks of the bifurcation of nature, because the link between these two natures, nature as it is perceived and nature as it is as a causal nature, nature per se, is very difficult to make within this framework. My personal problem now is that it's very hard to work around this bifurcated concept of nature in a university, because its departments or its assumptions are built into the very foundation of each university. Simply think of the division into departments, into natural sciences and the humanities, and how each methodologically kind of claims to be able to explain the other or also in that way overpower the other. And I remember, Alex, you were also speaking of a similar experience in your field in the art world. Yes, um, in the art world, the studio um, is still thought of as a lonely place um, where the artist works alone on objects which are then made public in exhibitions. Um, my practice, however, along with lots of others, um, involves designing modes of encounter as a way of making artworks that are then, then also become settings for dialogue and exchange. Um, and since this involves lots of other people at every stage of the process of making, um, I find that the persistence of this model of development in the studio and then presentation in the gallery is a kind of artificial separation. And I also find the notion of a general public is too abstract, um, that the networks that generate a specific audience um, for a specific exhibition are of great interest to me. And I'm concerned with both engaging and generating that network. So what I find insufficient in the structure of the art world's development presentation model um, is the value that it places on finished products, um, which are assumed to be kind of universally re uh, relevant to anybody who encounters them. And this generalized idea of the public and the normative so-called viewer erases difference from the model of the art encounter and perpetuates a kind of modernist model of uh, subjectivity, the solipsistic self. Um, so instead, I seek to kind of explore uh, the way in which concepts, materials and processes flow and are formed between those who engage um, with one another. And I also begin from a desire to reimagine the gallery or museum as an explicitly social space. And because of this, I'm often faced with the dilemma of wanting to try out my situation designs in, a, um, in an in-between space, neither the museum nor the studio, and Formations uh, has been that space. Yeah, so Formations started out from this situation in, in which theoretical assumptions sedimented into practices and institutions, and our conclusion from this was that it's not enough to criticize them theoretically, but rather that this calls for practical responses. So this is why we decided for this maybe a little naive, if you want, approach of just jumping into doing immediately rather than like applying for research grants and endeavoring research on transdisciplinarity. Um, so we, we were interested in the specific encounter of the specific practices and people that we gathered. Um, and we were curious about the specific processes generated by these encounters and how to see and to see how and if we could learn to speak with one another across these disciplinary divides. 
Felix Guattari's notion of three intertwined ecologies was an important conceptual tool to, to try and do this. So Guattari ins insists on the importance of the interplay between three ecologies, the environmental, the social, and the mental ecology. To him, and I quote Guattari, we cannot conceive of solutions to global warming without a change in mentality, without promoting a new art of living in society. So for him, this requires producing new kinds of subjectivities, and one could add it also requires new kinds of anthropotechniques, or let's say different kinds, I mean, new is somehow a relative term, as, as John has pointed out, and one that we weren't too interested in, in let's say, in, in creating formations, because our aim was less to be original in some sort, but rather asking how to inherit what, we, what preceded us. So returning to Guattari, his idea of three intertwined ecologies guided our discussions and the way that we set up our workshops. Building on this, with Isabel Stengers, we could say that we tried to, what we tried to do was to create a space for an ecology of practices. So a space in which practices can encounter one another and respond to problems that exceed one discipline without one practice or one form of knowledge overpowering the other. So this is why we took knowledge production in a large sense um, and included practices that have been excluded as valid forms of producing knowledge in modernity. So like the arts, bodily and spiritual practices. And this is also why the proposition of, of tonight to include wisdom in the, into the conception of knowledge, so to let our conception of knowledge be challenged by introducing wisdom, seemed very interesting to us. So this somewhat implies a, a longer discussion than we have time for now, but in creating formations, we felt that today, so in times when the limits and deadly consequences of a certain idea of knowledge have become very palpable, it isn't enough to simply open the gates to more and different forms of validation. So rather, it's the whole structure, the core of what it means to know that needs to be discussed. The notion of knowledge itself needs to be reassessed. So a modern notion of knowledge, as supposedly factual, objective, experientially verified, has been called into question in many different ways, for example, in the fields of science and technology studies that looks at the actual practices of knowledge production rather than the theories about scientific knowledge. It's something that John also has shown, I think, very beautifully. And not the least, also within the sciences themselves, it's something that I think has become very often overlooked in the humanities. Um, this notion of such a self-assured knowledge has been called into, into the question in the hard sciences themselves already at the beginning of the, cent the century, of the 20th century, if you think of the repercussions of relativity or quantum theory for what it means to know. So with this historical view, for example, on modern or early modern practices of knowledge production importantly showed, I think, is that what, what they validated scientific knowledge by, that they, was that they validated, sorry, scientific knowledge by excluding other forms of producing knowledge and disqualifying them as mere belief. So it's we scientists know, or like moderns know, the others merely believe. So, and I'm not saying that any specific scientist says this, I don't even think so, I think they would contest, but there's like a structural, um, I've learned this from Roman, so there's a, there's a um, no, I deeply believe it, it's a structural thing, so I'm trying to personify a structural situation. Um, so this is even why, even if it's a little uncomfortable sitting up here under the banner of wisdom, it seemed like an interesting challenge to re-include what has been excluded from the, from the modern conception of knowledge. So one could say it's a kind of a form of, of minor politics. Nevertheless, we added speculative to wisdom techniques because one, we don't think that a year of work is enough to become wise, and also because we think that wisdom can only be measured by its effects. So pragmatically, once it has been tested, it has been experimented with, so it's up to future uses and also to you to decide whether what we're presenting tonight contains maybe some germs for wisdom, let's say. Um, and I think an important aspect for us also in, in grappling with this notion of wisdom and taking it in this pragmatic sense is um, that by that we simply mean wisdom is a form of knowledge that's grounded in, in experience, experience taken in a most wide and speculative non-humanist sense, and it's a form of, of knowledge that takes its own consequences into account. So it's with these precautions in mind that we would like to present the format and practices of our, of our experimental working group as our first speculative wisdom technique, and Alex will say more about that. Yeah, so um, 
As Melanie mentioned, with this transdisciplinary group, we've, um, we're exploring and inventing intersections between our different ways of producing knowledge. So for us, the first step was, and remains, to question uh, the givens of specialised habits of thought, and therefore, first, to closely examine the implicit assumptions inherent in our material discursive setups. So these formats and practices were our starting point, and from there we tried to kind of shift specific elements while keeping others as they were in order to see how that could kind of change our way of encountering different practices of knowledge production. So in other words, um, what we've been trying to do is shift the framing of disciplines, um, but in that process to still keep um, the special wisdom techniques that each use to access and communicate our experience of the world. By this, we mean that um, within our specialised knowledges, there actually could be some kind of wisdom to be found. So our point is not to um, get rid of disciplines and specialisation, but rather to contribute to reshaping them um, in relation to these intersectional problems that force us to think today. So working over um, a sustained period of time as a closed group um, provided us with continuity, um, which you know, uh, was the possibility for a kind of in-depth engagement with one another, which we think is necessary for um, a meaningful transdisciplinary um, conversation. And in the past year, um, we've been meeting for these day-long workshops, um, and they were structured around two participants' practices at, at a time. And we began um, from analyses of each pr uh, practitioner's specific methods um, and focused um, on aspects uh, where the limits of disciplinary boundaries had actually already become manifest, rather than defining a, pro a common project that we would work on in advance. So this commitment to situated knowledges in the structure of our working group was um, a way to redress the absence of such a space for dialogue, um, which we all felt in the institutions that frame our various practices, as we explained earlier. So for each of the workshops, we experimented with um, their dispositive, so that is their discursive, spatial, temporal and other material conditions. And we tried to find points of convergence and divergence between the two practices that were in focus, while, of course, involving the other um, practices as well. So from these convergences and divergences, we then speculatively generated a term which we used to focus each workshop. So this term links both practices, but less as a kind of, uh, as a common denominator and rather a sort of um, a shared concern um, or a proposition. <laughs> um, a perspective through which to look at these two practices and their overlaps and differences. So the terms that we, we um, ended up devising through these workshops are um, patterns, examples, cases, visions and attitudes. And these keywords came out of our specific process and we feel that they capture important elements of um, knowledge production that need to be addressed when speculating about knowledge beyond modern binaries. Um, so this evening we're going to share um, and demonstrate a few of the techniques that we developed um, over our year to get, um, over our year of working together um, as formats for transdisciplinary experimentation, which we hope might be useful in a variety of contexts. So to follow on from the structure of formations itself as a speculative wisdom technique, the second technique that we would um, sketch out this evening um, is a conversation game that we played. Um, which has the potential to institute a long-term practice and produce a certain kind of group dynamic. Um, a dynamic that um, takes different forms of knowledge into account and enables their mutual validation. Called the authority game, it is modelled on the Milan Women's Bookstore Collective's practice of authority. They use this term to describe the way in which they give and take authority in, um, in their collective. Um, they use this spe specific practice of committed one-on-one -on -one relationships between the members, um, uh, between members with the different competences, knowledge, and access to political spaces. And then through these relationships, each gives the other authority um, in the situations that they each desire to act in. So this then becomes a way of obtaining the strength to assume authority in um, when it is offered as well. So they practice this um, as a way of um, shifting, um, yeah, a kind of shifting power to act based on trust in their group. So um, this practice of authority is based on their understanding that authority is the condition of having the power to speak from one's own uniqueness, and thus the ability to participate in the public realm on one's own terms. 
so it's not a condition that is created or maintained by another's. Um, uh, sorry, it is a condition that is created or maintained by another's acknowledgement of that authority, and it's not something that's argued for or um, for which coercion or violence are used. Um, but it's something that comes about through an acceptance of one's uniqueness and participation. So um, as an exercise in this practice in our group, we formed um, pairs and then attempted to each give our partner the authority to speak and in turn to take that authority when she or he sort of then directed it towards us. So the way that we prepared for this game was for each pair um, to have like a 30 minute conversation discussing the way that they each use examples in their different practices. And then during the conversation um, game with the group, they had to try and find opportunities to share the points that um, they had noted about um, their partner's use of examples. So that involved explaining um, one's partner's example to the group and then also theorizing their use in relation to the others in the group. So we had to sort of try and find a way to invite our partners to elaborate on our explanations on the use of examples, so thus inviting them to share their specific competence and knowledge. So these rules of play proved quite difficult, um, although there were some notable <laughs> moments of success. Um, but in the end, we found that the authority game um, could, could potentially be and began to be a way to ensure that everyone in an inter interdisciplinary group contributes, um, not only the participants who um, already hold discursive power as a result of existing hierarchies of knowledge. Um, so, yeah, and because the game requires participants to recall the concepts and methods and aims of another participant from a different field in detail, it ensures that participants listen carefully to each other and learn um, to put others' ideas and experiences into their own words, which helps to create a common language. Um, and, yeah, I mean, this... Um, there is a, a wealth of collective feminist practices like the Milan Women's Bookstore Collective's practice of authority, which could potentially be useful um, in practically reintegrating wisdom and knowledge because of the basis of many of them is the validation of personal knowledge. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so our next um, and third backlight of wisdom technique is what we called inserts. So with this format, everyone makes an insertion at the moment that he or she feels fitting, so in a time frame of around five to 10 minutes, and in a way that stays true to their or her own medium and practice. So what does this format produce? Inserts allow for different types of participation. They're a way of conversing in multidisciplinary groups and allow different forms of participation that are not necessarily verbal. Um, because obviously in our group and in transdisciplinary groups in general, talking is not everyone's medium. So most interdisciplinary formats privilege talking, and even the style of talking, which implicitly adheres to the host school. So this is mostly not, nece uh, or not necessarily intentional. I guess in very few cases is it, it is, but frames are set um, simply, for example, by the spaces that are used. So for example, in a conference room, it's difficult to do a physical exercise. Another thing that the inserts do is shift a linear time structure. So they acknowledge the way that in a meeting, the allocation of time is a powerful gesture and controls the mode of participation. The inserts distribute that power and thus disrupt the, intimacy or the primacy of any one discipline specific time structure because, like I said, they occur when a participant decides it is the right moment. So spontaneity is important here and it is a powerful tool too for tapping into the more intuitive aspects of knowledge production. So inviting inserts, one could say, is a bit like asking each participant to speak in their native tongue and then translate the parts of it that were co not comprehensible to the other participants. Importantly, the inserts also allow for changes in the atmospheres and types of activities. So in our meetings, uh, we had spontaneous contributions in various forms like video clips, body work, music, stories, and concepts. So these were contributions which engaged our cognition, our bodies, and our imagination in very different ways. And in our experience, they shifted the energy and the outcomes of our encounters in a significant way. So just to sum up with this inserts, we attempted to redefine conversation, opening it to various forms of communication and responses, and to create collectivity without heterogeneity. So creating <laughs> heterogeneity. 
Um, Formations began as an open format for research with the aim of following the trajectories of projects that emerged from our work together without determining an outcome in advance. And we felt that it would be important for this process that along the way we translate and rematerialize aspects of our encounters so as to create points of um, resolution and so that we could also communicate what we were doing to interlocutors outside of the group. So we devised a, a method to do that which um, we present here um, tonight as our next speculative wisdom technique. Um, we call this technique diffractions. Um, and as part of the setup of each workshop, we designed a way to bring our different practices together, combining our methods as a way of making something, a kind of um, collaborative group note-taking um, in various media. And so this practice took um, the place traditionally held by documentation. And it's an example of the way informations that we attempted to eliminate representationalist thinking. By that I mean that we um, actively engaged in how um, our encounters became communicable to others, rather than falling back on default modes of representing what we were doing. So default modes of documentation don't question the way in which they're coded by disciplinary conventions um, and also certain habits of thought. So as an example, the, assum the assumption that photographic media can transparently represent um, an event erases the materiality of the photographic document from our notice, which reinforces the modern binaries of matter and meaning, form and content. So referencing Donna Haraway's and Karen Barad's use of the term, we chose diffraction rather than documentation because um, diffractions are interference patterns. Um, they're a physical phenomenon that occurs when waves encounter an obstacle. Diffraction can occur with any kind of wave, including light waves, sound waves, and water waves. For example, when there's a small opening between rocks and the ocean, um, the w water waves diffract, bending and spreading as they encounter the opening. Diffraction describes the pattern that this kind of interference makes. Diffraction is a phenomenon which has played an important role in the development of quantum theory, which Barad takes up emphasizing the inextricability of matter and meaning and the ontological importance of relations. Diffraction is for us a, a way to describe um, what is produced when two practices or methodologies engage with or interfere with one another. In each workshop, we worked within the ripples or diffraction pattern made by thinking and experimenting with these two practices at the same time as a kind of material discursive experiment. So the final two wisdom techniques um, that we will present this evening come out of diffractions of our workshops. And for the first of these, I'd like to welcome Roman Prinsanik um, and Hendrik Weber to the stage. Um, and also Julian Schubert, who is embodying Rebecca Ladewig, who unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> on short notice, can't be with us um, this evening. So, so in the workshop that brought um, Roman and Henrik's uh, practices into dialogue, they noticed that their practices both involved the extraction of patterns from data. The speculative wisdom technique that we'll present now is a kind of proto-prototype um, for a tool that they developed out of this observation. Um, this is a kind of sketch for a tool that could potentially facilitate um, the extraction of both musical and scientific patterns from a given data set. We use this sketch to provoke a discussion and ways of thinking and feeling that go against the grains of disciplinary givens. So rather than communicating data spatially in graphic visualizations, as is dominant in the sciences, this tool would arrange data temporarily, sonifying it. There are many existing examples of sonifications in the sciences, like the way a hospital patient's heartbeat is sonified as a beep, which enables monitoring over time. However, by and large, data is overwhelmingly visualized rather than sonified. Contemporary musicians now often compose using samples, combining and arranging recorded data into patterns. Our experiment in formations was to explore if the sonification of a scientific data set could provide material for both musical experimentation and scientific analysis. 
what it is that you're doing on your computer? Sure. So um, I'm reanalyzing a data set from molecular cancer research. And uh, this data comes from measurements of uh, activity of genomes of different cancer tumors. And uh, this is basically how the data looks like. It's just a big table of numbers. And I have these numbers for 20,000 different uh, human genes and for 35 different uh, cancer samples. Um, and um, these numbers are taken from measurements of messenger RNA concentrations. And can you explain like, what you're doing with the data program? Yeah, what I just did was a, a simple supervised uh, data analysis. It's called supervised hypothesis testing, where I aimed at finding a signature of uh, tumors with, um, which lead to uh, death of patients and other tumors um, that uh, lead to better disease outcome. But you're taking the data from one place and putting it into another program or something like that? Right, I, I take the data from a data table, put it into this very simple software, and I end up with a set of uh, 300 genes out of 20,000 that make a difference and that, that are kind of gene signature and can predict uh, which, which of the patients uh, will survive and which will probably die of the disease. Okay. And um, what I did next was uh, I took this set of uh, 300 genes and uh, gave this uh, uh, list of uh, messenger RNA concentrations to Hendrik to sonify them. So Roman gave me his data set and I built this machine, or basically I built it with Kassian von Troja and um, we were thinking how can we kind of picture the data set, make it audible and we decided for a very neutral way to first kind of show the data to the human ear and um, now I will basically create from the data and put it in a spatial arrangement. I, I think you can already hear that it's kind of a eight channel kind of architecture that you're surrounded by. And um, yeah, now I will take this data into a musical process basically for a few minutes. Can you shut my microphone now, please? <laughs> 
So this sketch for a sonification tool could be considered um, a speculative wisdom technique insofar that it kind of uh, provides a, an idea for the way that the scientist might analyze her data um, using different sensors and gives the musician a source of sounds from which to extract patterns in the same move. 
Entrenched modes of thought are uh, bound to one sense, vision. In order to leave entrenched modes of thought, we need to leave entrenched modes of perceiving. So this technique of the sonification emerged from spontaneous responses to an encounter and helped us make our discussion concrete and provoked the expression of differences. Um, although, of course, it needs to be analyzed, tested, and contextualized to see if it's at all useful. Um, Rebecca Ladovic, our colleague, had some further comment, comments concerning the his historicity of the hegemony of visualization over sonification, um, and Julian has kindly agreed to read them for us. Thank you. Um, we call this diffraction the visual and the sonic, and its topic, as you could just see and hear, is a confusion of visualization and sonification, a mix-up that we could bluntly call visual and sonic noise. So what did we intend with this seemingly naive exchange of data? Obviously, sonification and visualization are two different ways to perceptualize data, to shape it in a way, either visually or acoustically, that makes sense to the human senses and that makes it per perceptible to our senses in the first place. Think of a Geiger counter that sonifies radiation, an entity that escapes our perceptive faculty. Along with the levels of radiation, the rate of clicking increases. The same goes for the technologies of visualization, and here the computational modeling of data into recognizable pattern that Roman just pre presented to us is just one of the most recent forms of visualization. Historically, visualization goes back as far as the introduction of the telescope or the microscope, instruments that did not only render invisible objects visible, but that in doing so produced these objects at epistemic things. So acknowledging the fact that visualization and sonification apply to different classes of epistemic phenomena, the question we'd like to raise is not how a huge digital file of data becomes a piece of sound or even music, but whether and how it might become a piece of sound that yields useful information. Does the epistemological framing of the situation have to shift along with the shift from visualization to sonification? And what are the epistemological implications for such a shift? Speaking from the perspective of cultural history and the history of science, in order to give some clues to these questions, I'd suggest to have a closer look at Roman's and Henrik's practices and to describe the historical context they came from. If we do so, we look at two entirely different fields of knowledge production. And these fields, in turn, involve different epistemic attitudes or, if you wish, different mental ecologies. A scientific one, in Roman's case, and an aesthetic one, in Henrik's. Even though the technical setup might seem equally important for both of them, at a closer look, we find that Henrik insists on what he calls a specific feeling he holds when he composes his data into sound. Henrik relies on his senses, especially his sense of hearing, in a different way than Roman does when he looks for pattern in his data that is arranged according to causal interpretation. Clearly, the role of sensation or sensory perception on the one hand and and the use of media or the technical apparatus, on the other hand, are related to the process of knowledge production in different ways in these practices. This is one of the, th of the, sorry, of the things we discussed during our workshop. So let me, brief, let me briefly recall what I remember to be the crucial pieces of the discussion. Starting from Roman's presentation and the observation that scientific data is commonly represented visually, our conversation revolved around the topic of the hierarchy of the senses. We wondered how exactly the visual organization of scientific knowledge relates to the primacy of vision, the fact that the sense of vision is traditionally held to be superior to the other senses. Is it really? Can't the ear with its sense of hearing that was considered to be a temporal sense in the 19th century physiology process a lot more process sorry process a lot more information than the eye that was considered to be a spatial sense to support henrik's point or henrik's ear we would reference we could reference the physiology physiologist hermann von helmholtz who stated in the 1860s that the ear even though it cannot count, 
can perceive 132 beats per sec, whereas the eye, as Helmholtz assumed, can deal with a maximum of 24 images per sec. Helmholtz is also an important reference when it comes to the instrument, instrumental and technical augmentation of, these, of the senses, which he still conceived of as measuring instruments in themselves that could be further developed by training. Uh, his resonator is both an instrument Helmholtz used to prove existence of overtones and a tool to train his ear to hear them. Based on the simple principle of putting air into vibration by blowing across the top of the opening, as we know from an empty glass bottle, the resonator is a sonification device and a hearing aid at the same time. But how could this possibly be relevant for a scientist today? Aren't instruments the better sense organs anyway and not only for scientists? To which degree have we already disembodied our senses? 20th century science studies provide two epistemological approaches that reflect opposed attitudes toward these questions and that very loosely relate to Romans and Henrik's practices as well. One considers central perception as an indis indispensable basis for knowledge and the other one places the progress of scientific knowledge in radical contrast to sensory perception. Gaston Bachelard stands for the latter tradition when he stressed that science, and he referred to the then dominant paradigm of physics, thinks through the apparatus, not through the sense organs. Here, the, sense, the senses do not even figure as models for an apparatus-equipped approach anymore, but instead should be excluded from the epistemic process altogether. Ludwig Fleck and Michael Polanyi represent a radically, radically different approach, both stating that scientific knowledge does not essentially differ in its process and structure from perception. Moreover, with the theories of thought style, Fleck, and the concept of tacit knowing, Polanyi, they pay attention to those elements in the process of knowledge production that systematically escape the rationalist tradition of science studies. Fleck's thought style acknowledges the social and cultural dimension of knowledge production and the embeddedness of experimental practices in what he calls a thought collective. Polanyi, in turn, even less orthodox, stresses the personal elements of knowledge, the commitment, tacit assumptions and convictions, a set of belief, even passions that direct the knowledge process and that are known only implicitly and cannot be articulated nor formalized. For Fleck, even scientific instruments embody some results of specific thought style and, to quote, direct our thinking automatically on the tracks of that style. What Fleck doesn't account for, at least not sufficiently in my, Rebecca's opinion, is the aspect of innovation. How and at which point, even if the instruments are partly material expressions of a thought collective, does innovation happen? Where does scientific discovery find its place in this process? We suggest it might happen by shifting the epistemological framework, by confronting our respective thought styles and by irritating our routines. Sonifying instead of visualizing data is just one example. Thanks, Julian. Um, okay, so for our last um, and the second diffraction for tonight and our last contribution, um, I would like to welcome Deborah Haxmann to join us on stage. So this dif diffraction is a format that came out of the workshop that diffracted Deborah's practice as a yoga teacher and my own philosophical practice. So at this hour we can only share an aspect of it, or let's say it's a prelude, um, but basically it's an exercise um, in what we called embodied abstraction and the abstraction that we work with is subjectivity. So in the conceptual frameworks we have inherited, abstractions have been disembodied, and we think it's an important, important project in reconstructing our ways of knowing to re-embody them. So taking the embodied nature of thinking into account is an extremely important aspect for reconstructing modern ways of knowing because, because it has huge repercussions for the concept of subjectivity and thereby informs our methodologies. So by this I mean that in our methodologies, there are epistemologies, so ideas about what it means to know, who can know what the knowing subject is. 
And even if a Cartesian notion of disembodied subjectivity has been heavily criticized within the humanities and has been replaced, let's say, by cultural or linguistically constructed subjects or collective forms of subjectivity, to my mind, Cartesian assumptions are still, still prevalent in our epistemologies formally, practically. So I think that our epistemologies methodologically rely on Cartesian assumptions that are so widespread that they have become invisible. So there's the assumption, for example, that thinking starts methodologically from the subject, be it understood in an individual or collective way, rather than, let's say, starting from a shared world of experience. Another implicit assumption running through most modern epistemologies is that the subject is a substance in whatever form, something that has attributes, qualities, but its core somehow never changes. A subject is always a subject, whereas objects are always objects. So these assumptions, which I kind of paraphrase from like my work on Whitehead, and just to allude, allude to in a very rough way, create a fundamental divide between subjects and objects, a fundamental gap between a solipsistic subject and the world out there, and this generates a problem that runs through modern thought. How can the subject bridge this gap between mind and world? How can it know that its knowledge is actually knowledge and just not just subjective illusion? And of course, there's the ethical question of how it can relate to others if they're only objects. So in contrast, if we think of the subject as an embodied one and take the physiology of thinking into account, and I'm thinking of the same discussions that Rebecca slash Julian has just alluded to in 19th century physiology. So if we take the fact into account that every thinking process is a f physiological one, too, then these assumptions are heavily criticized. Debbie, you had some like really interesting things to say about that. Well, knowledge emanates from the encounter of our body with the environment. And recent findings in neuroscience support this understanding of knowledge. In continuity between so-called higher and lower cognitive processes is our only way to create meaning. And if we accept that the mind comes from the brain, how can the body not be part of the mind? And knowledge can't just pop into existence or arise in our consciousness out of nowhere and from nothing. It is always in the, make, in the making through our body. And bodily tension, for example, has meaning for us based on muscular effort. Like tension creates motion, and release creates motion. And emotion becomes feeling on a higher cognitive level. And feeling is a consciously experienced bodily process. It is the origin of our ability to deal with a situation and to inquire into the meaning of a situation. And yes, subjectively, we would say we feel these qualitative dimensions, and yet they're not just subjective qualities. And by dismissing these experienced qualities as purely subjective, as if they were locked up in some private inner solipsistic world, is just not accurate. And then rather than just being private, interior, subjective responses, emotion and feeling are interactions between organism and environment. And they are both in us and in the world. And they are qualities experienced by all people, each and every one of us, who has a body like ours and lives in similar kinds of environments like we do. And emotion and feeling are crucial reference points for the quality of an experience shared, an experience transcending the subject. And what I recognize through my work, or our work, uh, through formations, is that, Melanie, your pragmatic approach um, in your philosophical practice and my practice as a yoga teacher share the same starting point and reference point, which is pure experience, to borrow um, the words of William James. And following the mainstream of both of our practices, our different disciplines, we both would get easily tempted to identify and describe absolute, eternal, normative principles. But what we share, Melanie and I, um, and attempt to work with is knowledge that arises in experience and that must be remade as situations change. And I mean situation in its fullest sense, in the Jamesian sense, 
and unifying the many aspects of experience. It's body mental, environmental, it's social and cultural conditions. And within a situation, experience as a whole, there's continuity and there's reciprocity between the imminent creation of meaning through our body and our reflective understanding of it. And thought starts from a situation, experienced as a whole, and perceived through the body. And yet we need thought as a tool for discrimination and differentiation to make sense of it. And William James described this process quite beautifully in his essay, Percept and Concept, quote, the perceptual flux as such means nothing and is but what it immediately is. No matter how small of it be taken, it is always a much at once and contains innumerable aspects and characters which conception can pick out, isolate and thereafter intend. So following James's description on how abstraction works, Abstracting involves distinguishing qualities or patterns within the flow of experience. And from this perceptual continuum, we select an aspect, typically an aspect that occurs across many experiences and many types of experience. And we select things that matter for us, things that have value, meaning, and significance. And we identify parts of the much at once-ness and apply them to understand and transform, transform our experience. What I learned from you, Melanie, is that the practice of philosophy should actually take care of abstractions. <laughs> but where our practices diverge, you know, our directions, our Suchbewegung, our quests, is that Melanie works in the field of abstraction and our capacity to abstract moves us farther and farther away from the concrete richness of felt experience. And when we abstract, we de-emphasize the perceptual aspect of feeling. Our body almost disappears. In the practice of yoga, we re-emphasize the perceptual aspect of feeling. And we use our capacity for concentration to move towards the richness of felt experience. And we train our perceptual abilities to have an in-body experience. So, diffracting both of our practices made the necessity evident for a tool, and you already mentioned it, we call embodied abstraction. And it is the starting point of a Suchbewegung, a joint quest that can take care of both directions, really. Because as situations change, embodied abstraction as a <laughs> kind of newborn wisdom technique in, still in the making is an inquisitive tool to initiate action that can transform and remake situations. Well, most likely, all of you <laughs> haven't been aware that you've been breathing all the time we've been talking. Well, we continue to breathe anyways, but let's breathe in a way that is conscious and intentional. And in order to fully experience what is coming now, please take your headphones off. Inhale consciously now and feel for using every air sac in your lungs, stretching your lungs open. And exhale slowly and deeply. Pull the belly in to wake up your abdominals and digestive organs. And let's do this all together. Continue to inhale consciously, feeling your lungs expand Exhale slowly and deliberately. And continue to breathe more deeply. <laughs> <laughs> 
I know that taking these first conscious breaths, they are the hardest ones. We all face this strange kind of hubris when it comes to breathing. We think we know it because we do it all the time. It's automatic. But more so, it's, brid it's bridging the voluntary and the involuntary. And conscious breathing is our own, our one common tool to explore towards the richness of felt experience. And breathing consciously re-emphasizes what knowledge in the making feels like. Now close your eyes and don't fall asleep. <laughs> Take the deepest inhale of the day, stretching across the lungs and ribs. And continue to exhale slowly and deliberately. Feel how your breath spreads your ribs away from each other. And just notice that it feels good to decompress your ribcage after sitting and listening for so long. And let your breath become powerful to amplify that quality of space in your ribcage. Make your breath audible. This gives you better feedback about the quality of your breathing. Breathe to feel yourself more fully. And let's pick a part of the much at onceness in the body. Feel your jaw. And direct the breath into your jaw. Feel the tension you hold there. Don't undo it. Intensify what you are identifying you are doing. Is your lower jaw clenching through the upper jaw? Are you grinding your teeth? Is there tightness in your cheeks, tongue, inner ears, neck, throat? And use your breath, whirling it around in the area you are investigating into. Now, intensify the clenching and the tightening and holding further for just a moment. And feel how this makes you duller inside. And I can talk to you about it so to the point, because I feel it too. Now, inhale fully and exhale, release. And very slowly, Start to glide your lower jaw from side to side. And just start moving your jaw from side to side. Don't jerk. And breathe to feel how slow you need to move in order to move your jaw smoothly. And adding another tiny movement to this, glide your lips from side to side along with your jaw. And keep the edges of your movement soft. And breathe to create a pervasive quality that supports your movement. And feel how this starts to loosen up your throat and inner ears. And feel how this movement loosens the occipital area, the area where the skull and the neck meet. Let it happen gradually, and feeling for subtle, slight sensations of release. And feel the back bottom of your brain loosen, the amygdala. The amygdala is the part of our brain that locks down patterns of fear, tension, and closure. It's the most conservative part of our brain, if you will. 
And feel for how using your breath in this smooth, subtle movement helps to ease some of the tension from that part of your brain. And loosen the tension that has been building up in there for the last couple of hours or days or even decades. Unwind it. As tension becomes emotion, emotion becomes gesture, gesture becomes posture, and posture becomes structure. But this process can go both ways. And remaking doesn't have to be this overwhelmingly complicated thing. It begins with something as simple as this experience. I hate to be the one to interrupt. <laughs> <clears throat> But I want to thank Formations for presenting us with these many glimpses of many different kinds of knowledge and even of wisdom in the making. Join me in thanking them. But, as you can tell by that sound, the evening is not yet over, yet over. There's one more wisdom technique that Formations is going to invite you to participate in. Alex, do you yeah. want to tell us about what's going on? <laughs> We would now like to invite you, um, all of the presenters from this evening, and you all, our audience, um, to come onto the stage with us. Um, And to, we're happy, we're all here to answer your questions and comments. You might also like to look through our Formations reference library here. Um, and yeah, we'd really like to get some feedback from you or answer any of your questions. And our fellow Formations member, Julian Schubert, um, is, well, <laughs> he's been preparing some drinks behind stage beforehand and now he's bringing them over. Um, I'll say it. <laughs> he might need a hand. Um, anyway, he's going to make some drinks for all of you who would like to stay and talk with us. Um, Julian, from over there, can you tell us what's on the menu? <laughs> yes, in a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, to, to finally turn this uh, auditorium Uh, a, a space where you can hear th something into a place where you can drink something, which would be a, a babytorium, maybe. <laughs> um, there's a drink on the menu that is actually, you, you could think it doesn't fit to this April weather uh, that you have outside, but it actually fits very well because it was originally created to cure or as a, as a remedy for the Spanish flu and also for the common cold. And originally it had lime, honey and garlic in it. Um, but then uh, the garlic, fortunately, was uh, cut out. The honey was exchanged with or replaced with sugar and rum was added and ice. So it's a caipirinha. Um, and, 
I will serve it in, uh, in two ways. The classic, which is lime and uh, sugarcane based rum. And my personal favorite, which is where the lime is replaced with passion fruit and the rum is replaced with vodka. So there are these two <laughs> things on the menu. I will start preparing now while you uh, can ask questions. And then I think you're yeah, welcome on the stage to be our and Hakavi's guests. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Julian. <laughs>